Why don't you turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. As you're turning over there, I challenge you to uh, see if you could name 10 of the gifts of the Spirit. And I, don't, I have not had a lot of people do that before the service, but I'll give you a chance afterwards. Now, we do have a list of the gifts of the Spirit, kind of a summary list of the gifts that you can pick up a copy from the ushers on your way out. Uh, but if you're going to go for the, the gift, you've got to uh, uh, do it before you peek, all right? But let me just go over the list with you real quick, because I do think it's important. We know what the gifts of Spirit are, and I realize it's hard to name them uh, just straight out, uh, but many of you do know them, but let's just go through there. And, if, and the first one is the gift of prophecy. Now, prophecy in the Bible times was where God would give them a vision or give them a word, and then they would uh, tell it to the people. And a prophet also would foretell the future. But the prophet today is a forth teller. The prophet takes the word of God as we have it written. We don't need new revelation. We've got everything we need right here. And he tells it to the people. And the prophet's the kind of person that when he preaches or he speaks or when he shares with you, uh, he just is able to share with the word of God in such a way it brings about conviction. And it just challenges you. And that's the prophet gift. There are many evangelists are prophets. Some preachers are prophets as well. But you don't have to be a preacher to be a prophet gift. Sometimes you can, you, often you can use that on a one-to-one -one basis. And then the second gift is the gift of teaching. And uh, the gift of the teacher is one that can take the word of God and explain it in such a way that you're able to understand it. And they just have a gift of being able to do that and to share it with others as well. And then you have the gift of ministry, and that's the gift of serving. And those are those are just to have that gift of be able to serve others. They're the kind of person that's often helping out, uh, cleaning up after church, or will uh, help out in a classroom or with a group of people. And they're just wanting to serve others. And then you have the gift of giving. And the gift of giving, we often think, well, the person with the gift of giving has like got a lot of money. No, the widow, the widow's might. She was a gift of. Uh, she had that gift of giving. It's the ability, first of all, to use your money wisely and then to have money to be able to give to others. And you just have a burden for that. You're able to, you give to the Lord, you give to missions and you give. If there's a need, you just seem to always have money to give to that need. And then you have the gift of ruling. And that's somebody who can oversee a task to completion, to provide leadership. And, and, and the gift of ruling is, is more in the sense of, uh, 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 of being able to organize well a project where there are others with the gift of ruling that are able to lead people well. So it can go in two different directions. And then you have the gift of exhortation. And to exhort means to come alongside. And that's somebody who just has that ability just to come alongside of someone else and, and, and is to be able to encourage them in a time of need to be able to help them uh, to keep going for the Lord and just has that ability. They, sometimes, again, preachers are great exhorters, and you feel like when they're preaching, they're talking to you personally, and they're empathizing with you and really uh, speaking to you. And uh, many times people as individuals have that same gift to work with one-on-one -on -one with others. And then you have the gift of mercy. And the gift of mercy is that ability to empathize with people's physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual needs. It's the kind of person that when you're sick, they really genuinely seem to care. And they're the kind of person that when you're going through a trial, uh, they just, when, when you're done talking to them, you feel like you, they're taking part of your burden with them. And uh, they have that gift of mercy. And then we have some of the gifts that are, are thought of as being Bible time gifts, the gift of tongues. And in the Bible times, that was the ability to speak in a language that you've never studied. Uh, we don't have that gift, I believe, today. But I do believe there are some people who are able to glorify God through language and music. Uh, when you hear a special and music and somebody just speaks to you, and when they sing, it, it just lifts your heart to the Lord. That's, that, I believe, is a gift of tongues as is practiced today. Or when somebody gives a testimony, and rather than say, what a great testimony, you say, what a great God. That's somebody who's got that gift. And then the gift of miracles. And again, in the Bible time, miracles were done by laying hands on people and, and, uh, and, and calling upon God. And again, I don't believe that's done in the same way today, but I do believe there are some people that just seem to be able to call down a miracle from God. They just have that prayer and that faith to trust God and say, I know God's going to do this. And then there's the gift of healing. And again, in the Bible days, when you healed somebody, you would lay hands on them and, and <clears throat> see them get up and walk or whatever. And again, I, I don't believe that's the way God works today uh, in the same way, but I do believe that God heals. 
Uh, I've seen many, many times where prayer has healed somebody and, and the doctor said, I don't know how this happened. And uh, people with the gift of healing, they're the kind of people that just know how to pray for you when you're sick. There are some people that when I'm sick, uh, you know, you tell them I'm sick and they kind of look at you like, get over it, you know. Uh, but there's other people when you're sick, you know they're going to pray for you and they're going to care for you. And then there's the uh, word of wisdom or knowledge in the Bible days that was ability to have some special revelation from the Lord today. It's people just have a certain amount of discernment to be able to see things that the rest of us don't, discerning the spirits. And then hospitality, the gift of hospitality is making people feel welcome wherever they are. Now, that's a very quick summary. And uh, we in the class, we talk about <clears throat> ways to see that. For example, when somebody uh, drops a plate of food on the floor, you can often tell somebody's gift by their reaction. If their reaction is to say, you know why that fell on the floor? Because you put it too close to the edge. They're probably a teacher or a prophet. Uh, if their reaction is to say to you, uh, you know, don't feel bad, it's okay, it happens to everybody, that's probably the gift of mercy. If their reaction is to get down on their hands and knees and start picking everything up and clean it up, that's the gift of serving. And um, if their reaction is to stand up and say, okay, you go get a mop, you go get this, and you take care of that, that's the gift of ruling. And so you can often see those gifts in that way as well. And so I'd encourage you afterwards to pick up the summary list, and then also you can um, download the series that I did on the gifts of spirit. They're available on YouTube. And uh, I think they put a link onto Facebook today to take you there. And I'd encourage you to go through that and uh, learn what the gifts are, learn what your gift is, and learn how can I stir up that gift and, and use that gift for the Lord's purpose in my life. And, and so I really encourage you to follow through on that. And, and because the Bible says, don't be ignorant uh, this is one of the areas concerning spiritual gifts. Don't be ignorant. Don't be stupid here. Make sure you know what they are. Make sure you know what yours is as well. And the others, because you need to know how to fit yours in together with everybody else, to work together as a team. We need the servant working with the mercy, working with the, the giver and all the rest of it. So make sure that uh, you follow through on that as well. Now, we're looking at Ephesians chapter 4, <coughs> verses 11 through 16. Let's read those again. He says, He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So there's three reasons he gives the church to you. He says, I'm giving to you for the perfecting of the saints to help you to mature and to grow. And then we're also there to help you to do the work of the ministry. A lot of times people think, well, we pay the pastor to do the work. And, and my job is not to do the work. It's to train you and teach you and help you to do the work of the ministry. And then for the edify of the body of Christ, to build us up in the Lord as well. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And remember, perfect doesn't mean never do anything wrong, mature, growing in your relationship with God and others. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to see. But speaking the truth in love <coughs> may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we pray that tonight as we open up your word, that you would open it to our hearts and to our lives. We pray that you would help us to not only understand what the gifts of spirit are and what our gift is, as we talked about this morning, but we'd understand how to edify, how to, to be built up in the Lord in our own lives and how to build up others as well. <coughs> so Father, we pray that you would use your word tonight in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <coughs> I apologize for the cough. Ever since I had COVID back in December, I just can't get rid of the cough. But I am tested negative for COVID, so make sure you're worried about that. But what I want to talk about tonight, this morning I used the illustration of tools. As a workman, you got to know how to use the tools to build. And the word edify means to build. And, and so if you're going to build, you've got to have the right tools, and you've got to know how to use those tools as well. Uh, many people just don't have the toolbox. They don't have the tools. And, and, and so you don't have anything to work with. And one of the things I talk about in counseling, when people come to me for counseling, they want to start out by telling me, let me, let me let's, let's tell you about all our problems. And I tell them, well, wait a minute. Before we talk about your problems, we need to deal with that. But more importantly, we need to talk about how to fill your toolbox. Because if you don't have the right tools, you can't fix your problems. 
And, and so we need to get, get the right tools. And if you're a workman, you know that you're always looking for an excuse to buy tools, right? Uh, Brother Mike knows that. Uh, any, uh, hey, that broke. I can buy a tool, you know? And uh, it's just always looking for an excuse to get a new tool to do that job. And then, but you've got to learn how to use the tools. A lot of people have the tools, but they don't know how to use them correctly. And I, sometimes I cringe when I watch somebody using a tool and using it wrong. And, and so we've got to have the right tools. And so what I want to do tonight is talk about the tools that we need to do, use to build relationship. And I'm probably going to talk about marriage. I'm teaching on Thursday night a small group Bible study where they're watching my marriage series on video. And then in the Bible study by Zoom, we talk about the, the things that we're watching. If you want to join us, it's on Thursday night at 7 o'clock and just let me know that. And uh, so we're going through it there, but it's always good to remind ourselves of these things as, as a church family as well. And if you're not married, these are good principles for your future uh, relationships, and, but their principles also apply to every relationship, whether it's parents and children, whether it's uh, apply to relationship with friends and family or other church members or wherever else, these same principles apply. And, and again, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, study to show, show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So when we, I was looking at what tools do I want to use to illustrate the message tonight? And I thought, first of all, well, I could use a, a nut driver because uh, a lot of you ladies think your husband's nuts and this would help you out in fixing his problems. Uh, but I also thought, well, I could use a screwdriver because a lot of men think their, lives have got, their wives have got a few screws loose and need some work there as well. And that's a good possibility. But the, the first tool that I thought of in using tonight is a saw. And uh, the reason I thought about a saw is, do you remember when you first saw your spouse? Do you remember when you first saw your spouse? And, and I, 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 in, in Genesis chapter 24, verses 63 and 64, it is talking about Isaac. And the Bible says that Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the even time. And he lifted up his eyes and saw and beheld the camels were coming. And Rebecca, his future wife, uh, was on one of those camels and she lifted up her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. I mean, she got, she jumped off the camel and said, I, I got to go see who this guy is. And they, they, that first time they saw each other. Uh, do you remember when you first saw your spouse? I want you to think about it. those of you married. Do you remember when you first saw your spouse? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the microphone here and I'm going to ask a couple of you to tell me about when you first saw your spouse. And so I'm going to start with Brother Palmer over here. And if you can tell me when it was that you first saw her. All right. So we're going to go ahead and give you the microphone there. And you tell us when was it you first saw your spouse? Okay. All right. So you got off the airplane, lighted off that airplane when you saw her and just ran over there to see who this lady was. All right. All right. All right. So that's good. All right. How about you, Brother Mike? When did you first saw your, your wife? Come on. <laughs> well, give us, give us the abbreviated version. Of that. We can go with that. Okay. Mm hmm Yeah. There you are. All right. That's, that's, that sounds good. All right. I'm going to come over here to Miranda. Yes. What did you first see? Evan. I'm going to get one of the ladies in here. All right. Oh, and I was giving a brief over at Nyak, Hawaii, and he was sitting in the front row, and his big brown eyes were like, eye contact the whole time and he later we found out you. that on the way back him and his friends were talking back and forth about me and oh she's so cute and oh she's this and he was sitting quietly in the back and apparently yells dibs <laughs> <laughs> all right all right i'm gonna come over here brother nordstrom i know some of you can't see more brother nordstrom if you can come over here where they can see and hear you at the same time i'm gonna put you on the spot when do you remember first seeing uh, connie all right it was at a wedding. Um, no, I, no I was wedding? no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> There's a show about that now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was. It was a friend in the Navy who was getting married 
and I was in the sword arch and the sister was Connie's best friend. So we met at the wedding. Okay. All right. Good. And I'm right here with Noelle. So we're going to ask you, when did you first remember seeing Jason? Um, so we went to the same high school together. He sat two seats in front of me. My boyfriend sat next to me. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. and so, um, yeah, he was kind of the computer guy in class. I needed help on the computer. So he came and helped me and I was like, oh, and he was older. So older kids didn't, students didn't talk to younger students. Yeah. So, and it went from there. Okay. All right. Good. And let's see, I'm going to come over here and pick on Brother Belza and just ask you, when did you first see your wife? So I'm going to come over there and ask you. All right. Uh, so you, she's one of the passengers in uh, in uh, rail in uh, Man Manila. Oh, okay. So when I first to see her with her auntie, with my previous uh, colleague. Okay. So we just met and then. All right. That's so it. is that work? You were driving the rail? Yes. Okay. All right. And brother Dindo, I'm gonna ask you when you first see your wife. Um. Um, Eileen's uh, cousin is a, the, a pastor, and uh, he had in, his internship in, in our place, and then uh, she visited our place, so that's uh, where I saw her. Okay, all right. Answer, come on up here. <laughs> Tell us when you first saw Cassandra. We were in the, we were in the teen group, and uh, she liked me first, though. Um, so <laughs> what happened was... <laughs> <laughs> we became friends in the teen group. So, uh, Cassandra, is that true? Uh, you want to give a fear, Cassandra? You tell us the other side of that story. Um, I first saw him at a Micronesian field day back when Pastor Anter was there, and um, he was hanging out under a tree with all his cousins, and they were all acting cool. And he was wearing a green tank top with a green and yellow sports headband across the way <laughs> and rocking even the wristbands too so yeah <laughs> but, you, but you really don't remember the first time you saw him all right all right but you you think back to that first time you saw that person you know and, and the bible scribes for isaac it was kind of an arranged marriage and i'm sure isaac was nervous about what kind of you know am i going to put a bag over her head or whatever and and uh, he saw her coming, and she saw him, and, and it was love at first sight, and that, that first reaction and, uh, and, and, and doing that. And see, what I want to remind you of is what did you see in each other? What was the good? Well, you, you saw good in each other, something about them. The first time I met my wife, or really remember meeting her, and she remembers meeting me, is, is was in the dining hall at college, and uh, I was dressed up like a clown. I used to do uh, clown things for the kids. Uh, it was called Sad Hap the Clown. Once I was sad, but now I'm happy. I had studied under Circus Clown for a while, and and, and for a lot of you think, well, that explains a lot about you, Pastor, and it probably does. And I had all the makeup on my face, and I had, uh, if you remember Emmett the Clown, I was uh, uh, like him. He was a, a kind of a hobo clown, and I'd done something for the school. Uh, they'd asked me to do something for one of the football games in my clown outfit, and I, I just stayed that way when I went to lunch, and she was sitting there at a table. There were seven girls uh, including my wife, uh, that, who was not my wife, of course, at the time, and, and one empty chair. And I looked around and I thought, well, I'm with the guys all the time, so I'm going to go sit with those girls. And I sat down next to her and I started talking to her and she was so embarrassed, you know, uh, talking to a clown. She said, who is this clown? And that's how we first connected with one another. But you know, what you do is you see the good in each other. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7, it says that love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. And if you think back to when you first met, whether it's your spouse or whoever it might be in your relationship, you think back to all the good things that you saw in that person. And sometimes when we've been married a while, we start focusing on the bad rather than on the good. And uh, we tend to, to see the bad. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 8, it says, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity or love shall cover the multitude of sins. And in our relationships, we need to focus on that which is good rather than focus on that which is bad. To, to cover the multitude of sins and say, I'm not going to focus on what's bad here, but I'm going to focus on what's good in this relationship. And, and, and we need to learn how to do that. In Proverbs 27, verse 17, it says, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. 
And, and one of the things that happens so often is, is you know, uh, Rebe- um, Rebecca's response when she saw Isaac. She lighted off her cam- camel. I-, I could just kind of imagine that, that she was looking off in the distance and, and, and the servant that was with her had gone to bring her back as Isaac's wife. As they were coming in closer, he said, oh, that's, that's Isaac. That's the guy you're going to marry. And I can imagine her eyes lighting up. I can imagine that her face just, uh, the reaction that was there and say, wow, that's the guy I'm going to marry. She jumps off her camel and runs towards him. And, and, and that's the kind of thing that we want to remember is, is how do you react to the people that you love? And, and how do we react when we see them? Whether it's, the, again, your spouse or whether when you come to church and you see somebody at church say, hey, good to see you. And, and that reaction that we have. But the, the second tool I thought about uh, was, a, was a hammer. And, and we, of course, we use a hammer for many different things. And, and a lot of people use hammers wrong. In, in Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse number 29, it says, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? And hammers sometimes are used to break something up. But you know, there's a right way and a wrong way to break things even. And uh, sometimes people use a hammer and they do more damage than they do good. And you watch some of these shows and they go in there and start swinging at everything there. And and that's not what you want to do. Sometimes you do have to tear something down before you can build it up. And and especially the Word of God uh, many times will be like a hammer to break our hard heart, to break us of our old habits, to break us of the things that we're doing wrong. But we need to do it the right way. In any relationship, again, in a marriage, there's things that you say, you know what, the, I, I, I don't, don't like this. This is not good for our marriage. But we go in there and just start swinging at it rather than really trying to do the job right. And when you use a hammer, one of the things that's important is, is how you hold the hammer and how you swing it uh, so that when you hit the nail, you hit it on the head. And you hit it square. Many people, when they're hitting the nail, they're hitting at an angle like this, and that's why the nail bends. And you've got to hold that hammer right uh, to get that leverage. You've got to hit that nail right on the head. In Matthew chapter 5, and verses 23 and 24, it says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother have aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. In Mark chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, it says, And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. And here's the problem, is when we have issues between us in our relationships, we very rarely seem to be able to hit the nail on the head. And we're just kind of swinging, and we end up doing more damage than good. I, I watch some people, and, and by the time they're done, there's all kinds of marks all around where it's supposed to be, but not where they're supposed to be hitting it. And, and the Bible says, listen, if you have ought against your brother, or if they have ought against you, so often we'll say something like, well, if they got a problem, they come talk to me about it. But the Bible doesn't give us that excuse. They said, if you have ought against them, if there's a problem with them, or if they have a problem with you, you need to go and deal with that problem and rather than beat around the problem, and that's what we do in our marriages so often, don't we? We never really come and hit that nail on the head. Uh, we just kind of beat around it. And we need to get to the issue and say, here's the problem. How are we going to fix this problem? How are we going to deal with this problem? And we want to hit that nail on the head. And, and, and don't beat it to that. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And look at verses 6 through 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 6 through 8. Sufficient to such a, a man is the, is the punishment, this punishment which is inflicted of many, so that contrarywise you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore I beseech you, in you that you should would confor- confirm your love towards them. I remember when we were working on the old building over down here by Wendy's and Cycle City. There's another building there with the roofs that go like this. And that's where we used to meet before we moved in this building in 2010. And we moved to that building in 1999-2000. And when we got the building, it was a, it was a disaster. There had been, uh, it had been empty for many years. Homeless had lived in there. 
uh, that had been neglected for a long time. And then one of the homeless started a fire inside there. So when we got the building, it was kind of a burned out mess. I mean, the, when we moved in there, uh, the, when we started working on it, the first Saturday, we took 60 loads to the dump. And, and not just pickup trucks, these were big, big trucks. And we took 60 loads to the dump, we hardly touched anything. I mean, it was just a mess in there. And we were having to clean it up. And then we had to <coughs> not only get it cleaned up, but then we had to convert it into a church. And I remember we were down there doing some work and there was a lady in the church that her husband not too long back had left her and, and uh, she was over there uh, hammering something. And when I walked over, I said, uh, you're thinking about your husband right now, aren't you? Because <laughs> she was just beating on that thing. And I understood she was, she was uh, taking her anger out uh, on that poor little board there. Uh, but that's the way we do sometimes is we just kind of uh, beat it to death. And, and here was a man who had done wrong. There's no question about it. This was a man who had lived in adultery and not just in adultery, but was living with his stepmother in sin. And, and, and Paul had said back in 1 Corinthians, he said, this is wrong and you guys need to deal with it. You need to discipline him and, and you can't just act like it's okay. And, and, and so uh, they did that obviously. And then they, so now he, it, apparently he'd repented. And he had confessed his sin. He got right with God. He was trying to get right with others. But people were still holding it against him. And rather than come to him and confirm their love and say, okay, we, we, we hit the problem. We hit the nail on the head. And, and we're going to deal with it now. And moving on, they were still being judgmental. They were still being harsh with him. And Paul said, wait a minute. You, you can't beat this to death. And, and boy, that happens in marriages so, so often. It happens in other relationships as well. We have a problem and, and, and we just keep coming back and, and, and beating that problem to death. Rather say, you know what? We've dealt with the problem. We've asked forgiveness and let's move on. Uh, and I know that's hard to do. When you've been hurt, it's hard to let go of that hurt. When, you, when somebody has done something wrong, it's hard to forgive them. It's hard to move on. But we can't just keep beating it to death. We've got to move on. In Ephesians chapter four, verse number 15, it says, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And, and, and there's times that you do need to hit that nail, but you need to do it in love, not in anger. You need to do it not to beat up the other person, but to say, you know what, well, we've got to fix this problem. And, and how are we going to fix the problem? How are we going to move on from here? And, and that's important for us to do. And then the other thing, the other tool I thought about is the tape measure. And, uh, you know, we use a tape measure for many different things. Go back to Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four and look at verse number 13. Ephesians four thirteen says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And let's go down to verse number 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make it increase the body on the edifying self in love. We need to measure how our relationship is going, to measure where we're at in our relationship. Now, so I thought I'd bring this tape measure here to see how long my sermon is going to be. That's not going to work, is it? You've got to measure the right things and you've got to have the right tools to measure with as well. And, and so often, when we look at a relationship like our marriage, like our family, like whatever relationship it is, we're measuring the wrong things. And, 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 and we're trying to measure our, our, our relationship like I would be trying to do it with, to measure time with this right here. And so we need to make sure we're doing the right measurements, that we're doing the right, that we have the right standard. Go over to Deuteronomy chapter 25. Deuteronomy chapter 25. And look at verses number 13 through 16. Deuteronomy chapter 25, and beginning with verse number 13. Thou shalt not have in thy bag diverse weights, a great and a small. Thou shalt not have in thine house diverse measures, a great and a small. But thou shalt have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure shall thou have, that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. For all that do such things and all that do unrighteously are an abomination unto the Lord our God. And so often 
where we struggle in our relationships is we're using the wrong measurement. We're using wrong. You know, I, I find a lot of times I'm judging my wife and measuring her by standard that's not the same in my life. You ever did that? I, I, I'm saying, well, you're not doing it, but I'm not doing it either. Well, you're doing it, well, but I'm doing that also. And so often we, we're willing to measure in the other person's life and judge them in their life and not willing to use that same measure with ourselves. Because in your house, you need to have the same standard. If this is what you're going to expect from your spouse, you need to expect it from yourself as well. If you're going to demand it of them, you need to demand it of yourself as well. And we need to use that, that same measure in doing that. Go over to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And look at verses number 1 through 5. Matthew chapter 7, and beginning with verse number 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you met, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the, the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. And so often we're, we're quick to judge the other person's relationship and look at their problem, but we've got a bigger problem in our life. And, and we've got to realize that I've got to work at what's in my life as well. One of the things I talk about in the marriage class is so often what happens is our problems. And, and it kind of goes back to what we talked about earlier on is that we've got to be willing to cover the multitude of sins. And what happens is, it's not even just a, a beam, but we, we've allowed it to become the focus. This pin is not very big. In the perspective of everything, it's really kind of small. But if I put it right here, boy, it dominates everywhere I look. It, it's, a, it's a beam, because it's so big in my eyes right now, because I put it up front and center. And so often, that's what we do in our relationships. We find this little problem but we allow it to become the dominant thing in the relationship. We allow our focus to become on that, whether it's with our spouse, our children, our parents, or whatever other relationship, we allow this to become that dominant. And what we need to do is we need to put it back in perspective. And we need to look at it and say, well, in perspective, there's a lot of good about this person. And I wanna see the good. I wanna see the positive and, and put it in perspective and get my focus off of the problem and put my focus on the relationship as a whole and, and to change that standard of what I'm looking at. In Ephesians chapter four and verse number 26, it says, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now, a lot of times when people go to Matthew chapter seven and say, well, you, you have no right to judge me. The Bible says you shouldn't judge me. No, when there's a problem, you need to deal with a problem. You need to deal with a problem but you need to do it in the right way and, and, and not to do it in anger. One of the things that when I deal with a couple, you know, many times with couples and, and their counseling, one of the things I find is there's something to happen. Maybe there was adultery or some kind of a, abuse or maybe there's another <coughs> problem that happened, disappointment or whatever. And one spouse or the other will have this problem and, and they'll say, well, I forgive them. But they still are mad at them. And a lot of times I'll say to the, the, the spouse, whichever one it is, I'll say, okay, I need to know how long you're gonna punish them for what they did. How long are you gonna stay mad at them and punish them? Because until we figure out how long this is gonna be, we can't move forward. See, a lot of times we say, well, I forgive you, but we continue to punish them. We continue to bring up the problem. We continue to focus on that. And we're not willing to let it go. And, and, and you have a right, when somebody does something, they violate your trust or they hurt you in some way, I understand you're angry. <clears throat> in fact, that you need to be angry. And I, I counsel many couples, I said, listen, while this problem is here, let's deal with it and make it clear this can't happen again. This can't continue. Because you know all of us are human, no matter, how, no matter if we forgive, you keep doing the same thing to me over and over again, and human nature is what? There's gonna come a point, I said, that's enough, I'm done. And before that point comes, let's deal with that problem, let's deal with that issue, and, and resolve it. 
And the Bible does say that when we, somebody, the disciples said, Lord, how often should we forgive our brother? He said seven times in a day for the same thing. Well, I don't know about you, once, twice, maybe three times I could forgive, but seven times in the same day? Another passage says 70 times seven. Do you know what the disciples' response was when he said seven times in a day to forgive them? They said, Lord, increase our faith. Because it's something is in the flesh, it's hard to do. And it's, it's, Lord, if we're gonna forgive somebody seven times in one day, we need more faith. And, and faith is the, we need more strength. We can't do this without your help. But the point is, is once you decide, I'm going to forgive you, you have also have to decide, I'm not gonna be angry with you anymore. I'm not gonna keep beating you up about this. And, and so you need to measure and say, well, how long am I gonna punish you for what you did? Now, again, punishment is not just saying, well, you can just go back into your old habits and you can go back in your old way. I'm not saying that at all. And, and there needs to be a change in what, what hurt you and, and be a change in both of your lives and everything. But there needs to come a point where we say, you know what? This is, I'm done being angry and we're ready to move on. And we gotta measure that. And so, you know, the tools are just illustrations of our relationship and how to deal with those. And this morning I talked about the using power tools. Uh, my, my grandfather worked in a factory. He was kind of their maintenance guy over there. And, and uh, one of the things he did when he was working, this is back in, you know, this is back in the 1950s or earlier, probably earlier than that. He built a china cabinet out of pieces from pallets. Now this is back when pallets were made out of better wood than they are today. But he built this china cabinet. And, and years later, we were gonna be in Connecticut. We were traveling the mainland, raising support to start Ohana. And we were gonna be in Connecticut where my mom grew up and my grandfather had passed away. And, and my mom said, is there any chance you could get that china cabinet and, and send it to me? She said, that's the one thing from our childhood I wanted to get is I wanted is a china cabinet. And so we went there and I got, you know, and, and, and I, the china cabinet was big and I looked at shipping it, it was gonna be very expensive. And so I thought, I'll take it apart and, and, and mail it to my mom with instructions on how to put it back together. Now, my grandfather built this before power tools were around. He built a set of hand tools. And I just took that thing apart. I was amazed at how well he had built this out of pallet wood. He had built this china cabinet. It was absolutely amazing how well he put it together. I thought, that's amazing to think he could do that. I, but I'm so thankful for power tools. They make the job so much easier. In Ephesians chapter five and verse number 18, it says, be not drunk with wine or is an excess, but be filled with the spirit. In the early service, uh, we had the contest between Mike and I to, to saw. He had the hand saw and I had the power saw but I didn't realize that Jason hadn't put the battery in the power saw. Thank you, Jason. And uh, so I'm over there and nothing's happening. Because if you don't have the Holy Spirit, if you're here today and you don't have Christ, you don't have power. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. When you trust Christ as your Savior, when you believe on his name, you have the Spirit of God. Bible says in Romans chapter eight, if any man have not the spirit of God, he's none of his. In 1 Corinthians chapter six, it says, what know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. And so you and I that are saved, we have the power of God, we have God's spirit. But if you're not saved, it's like having a power saw with no place to plug it in. It's like having a power saw with no battery power. But it's like the battery power, you gotta keep that battery charged. If you've ever been doing a project, you run out of battery and it's not charged up, you gotta you got keep that <coughs> battery charged. And it's the power of God working in your life. We've been talking about, uh, I was going around asking some people, well, can you tell me the, the gifts of spirit? And a number of them got mixed up and started saying love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's not the gifts of spirit, what is that? The fruit of the Spirit. It's different than the gifts of the Spirit. And, and boy, it's that fruit of the Spirit, God working in your life. You see, you go hang an orange on a tree, it doesn't make it an orange tree. The orange comes from within. 
And, and a tree doesn't sit there and say, I'm a producing orchard, and you're stressing out. It doesn't do that. If a tree is growing and it's doing what it should be doing, it's going to naturally produce fruit. That's the byproduct of the growth. And you and I need to produce the fruit of the Spirit because it's the Spirit of God working in our lives. And that's where the real power comes from. And, and what I find in my own life, and I find the marriages I talk to people and other relationships, is we're struggling because we're trying. I, I get couples all the time. Well, we're trying, Pastor, but we're working in the flesh. And you get tired. I, I, you know, I've used hand saws before, and, and every time I do, it's just, it doesn't take long before my arm is sore, and I'm tired of this, and this doesn't, I'm done. And we can't do it in the flesh. We've got to do it in the power of God. But you've got to plug into that power. Romans chapter 8, verse 9, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for as God would work within you both to will and to do his good pleasure. We don't work for our salvation, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, then not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, so that amen should boast. We don't work for our salvation, but we are supposed to work out our salvation. And it's the power of God working in our lives to help us to produce the, 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 for the fruit of the Spirit to, to be able to do the work that God has called us to do. So what we have to learn to do is let the power do the work. In Ephesians chapter 1, turn over there, Ephesians chapter 1, and look at verses 18 and 19. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe according to the working of his mighty power. There's three different words in those verses about power. There's dumanos, and that's the power of God. That's like the power that's in the plug. You know, you have that power. That's the power in the battery, but you've got to plug into it. If you've got something that's not plugged in, it's not going to do anything. And that's salvation, is plugging into the power of God. But you can plug into the power of God, but if you don't turn it on, it's not going to do anything either. You, you've got to turn on. You've got to use that power. And, and that's the word, the mighty power of God, and then there's the word, um, it talks about according to the working of his mighty power. And the word working is where we get our word energy from. That's the efficient use of power. Most people use power to, tools wrong. Because what they do is they're trying with their strength to make the power tool work. If you take a drill and you're pushing hard in it, you're just burning through the wood. You're not cutting through the wood. If you take a saw and you shove hard on it, it's just going to get jammed up. It's not going to cut through that wood smoothly. It's going to make a mess. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to make our own power do the work instead of letting the power tool. If, you're, if your saw is a good sharp saw, it's going to zip right through that. If your drill bit is good and sharp, you don't have to put a lot of pressure on. It's going to do the work for you. And, 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 and that's what we have to learn in our marriages and our relationships in life is learn to let the power of God work. We're, we're trying so hard, we're actually causing more damage than good. And we've got to step back and say, God, I can't do this. I need your power. And, and, and so we've got to take care of the tools that we use, whether they're power tools or whatever they might be. We've got to take care of those tools. We've got to keep them sharp. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the tents of the heart. The word of God is sharp. And if I'm not sharp in God's word, that's why we need to read it and meditate upon it and study it and hear the preaching because that keeps us sharp in the word of God. And when I'm doing that, Boy, that's going to make such a difference in my life. But we've got to stay sharp in the word of God. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11, it says, Of whom we have many things to say and are hard to be uttered, seeing we are dull of hearing. 
You know what a lot of us have problems with? We come to church, we hear the preaching, we go home and nothing's changed because we're dull of hearing. We open our Bible, we read it, but nothing changes. I know people read more the Bible more than I do. I know people that know the Bible better than I do, but their marriages are a mess. Their life is a mess because they're dull of hearing. They're not letting the word of God sharpen them and work in their lives. Go to Ephesians chapter four and look at verses 28 through 32. Ephesians chapter four, verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands in the, in, in the thing which he is, it, it is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed on the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and, and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. You want your tools to work for you, you gotta take care of them. You gotta keep them clean. You gotta keep them sharp. You gotta keep them well-maintained. And, and again, the challenge we have in our relationships, marriage, family, whatever relationship it is, is what he's talking about here. He says you edify. He talks about edifying, building up one another. We don't tear down. We need to build up. We don't be angry. Be angry and sin not. And, and we, we've got to realize that when, we are, when there's sin in our lives, it grieves the Spirit of God. And we've got to take care of those things that God has given us. And use the right size tool for the right job. Well, I don't know about... Mike and Jason, mechanics here, guys at work, it really, I see people take a, a screwdriver and they got the wrong size screwdriver for the job or they got the wrong size hammer or they got the wrong size whatever else it is. You've got to use the right size tool for the job. In Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12, it says, hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covereth all sins. In 1 Peter 4, 8, and above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. In Proverbs 19.11, it says, the discretion of a man deferreth his anger and his glory to pass over in discretion. You know what doesn't work very well? Anger, bitterness, harsh words. Use the right tool for the job. And so I want to challenge you. Build your toolbox. Add tools that are going to help you in different situations. Get the right tool for the right job. Keep your tools sharp. Because what we want to do is we want to edify one another. We want to build up. And so how can I edify my wife? How can I build her up? Because when you tear something down, it isn't better. Now, there are times before I can build, before we can make this auditorium, we had to tear down some walls. We had some people in here that were making more, they were doing more, more damage than good because they were just beating away at it. And that's not the way to do it. And sometimes you have to tear down in order to build. But if you really want to build a better relationship, then build it the right way. Whether it's in your marriage, whether it's you young people with your parents, with your friends, with your family, whoever it might be. Let's build the kind of relationship God wants us to have. Let's bow for prayer.